a warning, do not do this. This could damage the device or anything. But anyway, I had it in a position where it was open. So I turned it on, the red light came on. Now, but the green light never came on because the pressure could never build up because I had it open. So, and I had it sitting on my back porch and I was doing some chores inside and I was waiting for it to um, turn green. Normally that would only take a minute or two minutes. And I looked out the back porch and I saw, well, this is not turning green. I probably let it sit there for too long. It might have sat there for five, ten minutes. Now what might have happened is it could have boiled off all the water. Having boiled off all the water, now it's running dry. And this may not have a run dry feature, okay, where it can turn itself off. Because honestly, it didn't turn itself off. The red light stayed on. I went out there. It seemed empty, okay. And... Um, that was the beginning of the problem. So my guess is that I've damaged it by running a try. That's just speculation, but it could have happened, okay? Because after that point, um, it, it started showing problems. For example, um, and here's where my recollection will be slightly foggy because I didn't write all this down, but uh, subsequent to that event, when I tried refilling it with water, try to get it to work now in the proper position, using it outside, it kept tripping the GFCI. Now, outdoor, outside of my house, I have a GFCI because that's code. If there's any current going to the ground, and this does have a substantial third prong. So for example, if you look at the the wiring under this cap. This is the ground. It's the green wire. Okay, there was, it can handle a substantial amount of current going into the ground based on this wiring, but it only takes five milliamps going into the ground to trip the GFCI. So, for example, if the electrode inside of this was somehow damaged, and it was somehow now having a path to ground, now I could measure. I can ohm out a path to ground right here. I can go here to ground and I can see, okay, what the measurement's going to be. And what I find is, is that after I've got this totally disassembled, I'm not showing anything to ground. So from that point of view, it doesn't particularly appear damaged, okay? But it could have, this measurement can be slightly difficult to make. Uh, because of contacts. I, I can easily get 10 mega ohms or I can even get hundreds of k ohms. Um, so because of the corrosion that's taking place down here, when I own this, I have to make sure that I'm getting a good, a good spot. Okay, here, this I'm able to get, okay, I can get down to 0.1 ohm based on just this metal. So I know that my probes are making a good contact there. Now, if I get a contact to really anywhere underneath here, that will tell me whether or not I have a short. And I, I have cleaned off some of these terminals with sandpaper to give myself a good connection. Okay. So I'm not getting a short to ground right now. But that doesn't mean that I might not get a short to ground when I fill this up with water. Right now it's emptied out, but it's certainly not completely dry because you can't get all the water out of this. Underneath here, Almost certainly this is a sealed compartment. The heating element is probably not submerged in water. It's probably sealed off. And somehow the heat is transferred to the water. But if it were fa to fail, it's certainly not unusual for, to get some water in there. Once you get water in there, it's possible to create a short. This is just a possible way this might have failed. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to continue to experiment with this. I'm going to add water to it. I'm going to see if I can pick up the short to ground. But just to finish my story, this was tripping the GFCI breaker outdoors, indicating that there was a path to ground. And I disassembled it. All of this was very wet. Okay, what I don't have here is this insulation. It's like a fiberglass type, uh, the, the spun fiberglass insulation between here. I have it uh, right now out of my line, drying, drying it out. It, it was all wet, a very, very bad sign. I'm not sure exactly how the water got there. The device is over 30 years old, so hasn't been used in a long time, but that water probably isn't that old, so, but it could be, I'm not sure. Okay, 
this is all dried out now. When this starts to get used, if there is water wetness, and there probably will be if there's an issue, a leakage at some point, you can see, for example, it could easily be leaking at any of these screw positions or this terminal position. These screws probably hold in the heating element. I'm not going to unscrew those. Uh, reason being is that heating element might fall off on the inside and I can't reattach it, okay? Because this has probably been sealed after it was assembled. It could, those could be spots at which the thing is conceivably leaking. Uh, I could, you know, try sealing it at those spots, but to unscrew these, you know, it might just damage it further than it is. But once I've concluded what's wrong with it and it's, I've concluded that it is no good, there will of course be no further damage or danger in destroying it because it already doesn't work. Okay, now let me just explain a little bit on how this works between these two terminals is the heating element. Okay, then here, this is the sensing element. Okay, so if you're familiar with how a little electric kettle works, this looks like it works exactly the same way. So normally when this thing is cold, okay, this switch is closed and the hot, two hot connections simply go through the switch, through the heating element. When it does that, it causes the water to boil. Okay, and you can see that if I measure across here, I'm just going to get the 9 ohms or 10 ohms. The, 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 the switch itself, for example, is only a tenth of an ohm. Okay, um, if I reproduce all my measurements right now, they might not come out because I'm not, I might not get, you know, good, a good ohmic connection right on camera, but it's, it's there. Okay, that's a tenth of an ohm. Uh, when this heats up, this switch will open and then it will stop heating. That's how this is supposed to work. And the, and, and the, and, and the way a lot of these electric kettle would work is that once the water starts boiling, there'll be a small tube at the top. And that tube comes down to the sensing element. And when the, before the water boils, the sensing element is closed and the water continues to heat. Once it starts boiling, the steam of the boiling water gets into the, a small tube, which delivers the heat to the heating element. Uh, to the switch, excuse me, the sensor, which initially is isolated thermally from the heating element. It doesn't trip until the steam is generated. Honestly, by looking in here, I can't tell exactly how this particular one is, is set up. I don't know if this has a, a boil-dry feature, which in a boil-dry feature, there would be a way for this switch to open up even when the water's gone and this element were too hot, uh, we're, we're, we're getting too hot. We started to get beyond, as long as there's water there, the heating element is cooled by the presence of the water, but once the water's gone, then this heating element will start to get hotter, eventually damaging itself, unless it has a run-dry feature. My guess is because this shark does not advertise the run-dry feature, that it doesn't have it. And I have a suspicion that if you do not use the correct protocol, on heating this up within the closed position so that it has the opportunity to switch off that in the on position and we've let it sit there. Or if you, for example, were to turn it on without any water in it whatsoever, it would probably also get destroyed. Okay, now there aren't necessarily adequate precautions in the manual for that because I did read it very carefully to see if that was how it got damaged. Okay, so that's how this works, okay? And the way these little tubes work is one of them is red, one of them is green. One of them is across the switch, the other is across the heating element. The one that's across the heating element is red. So when this first turns on, the switch is closed. The, two, the 120 volts shows up across the heating element and it heats and that gives you the red light. When it gets hot and this switch opens, now there's no current, so the voltage is entirely across the switch and there's no voltage across the heating element. The red light goes off and the green light, which is across the switch, goes on. And that's how this is supposed to work, okay? That little switch, it slides into here and, and that I didn't have any trouble getting that to come off, okay? Uh, it, seems, it seems fine. There might have been possibly 
little piece of plastic that might have broke off, but I don't think so because I think when I put it back on, it seems fine. So that is something that you are able to remove. I wasn't sure about that when I was first getting it off if I wasn't going to break it, but it, I don't think it did break. Certainly, I could glue it back on if I had to, but I think it's actually fine, okay? I think that was originally just stuck on there because it was on there for so long. It did eventually come off with a little pop, but I think it's fine. I don't see any problem with it. Okay, uh, so that's how this works. I, I Like I said, I'm gonna have to do some experiments on this to see if I can find out where it's leaking from. If it's really leaking, will it work again? Like I said, I don't think it's going to work because it wasn't working before I disassembled it. I, I haven't found any obvious problem. My suspicion is it's just leaking the water, but it's leaking the water potentially mm, in such a way that uh, when I start operating it, it may simply get too wet to operate properly or for very long and it might develop a short to ground if it's too wet. But I should be able to determine if it is leaking and possibly see exactly where it's leaking from because I should in theory be able to heat this up or run current through it in such a way that I could actually see it in its normal operation uh, without the cover on it, okay? Uh, if I was able to do that, then I might be able to conclude exactly where it is. Okay, well anyway, I'm sure that's more than long enough to show you essentially how to completely disassemble this thing uh, the two the kind of screws that I, that I have didn't mention removing are just very standard Phillips head screws that will come out. I think the top parts I, I did show you, so thanks.